Haymaker Coffee Company was established in 2021 to create the best coffee to fuel the underdogs who perseveres, who hustles, and have the give-it-all mentality to achieve their American dream. Haymaker Coffee only roasts top quality, specialty-grade coffee beans resulting in brews that satisfies those who demand every drop from their coffee and day. If you work hard, run hard, fight hard, and play hard, we have your coffee right here. And we're back, Stripe Show Podcast, on a Monday. I'm your host, Travis Fulton. Thank you for making us part of your day. Hope you had a good weekend. Uh, lots of golf certainly being played all over the uh, all over the world. Um, I guess the question is, is there too much professional golf being played uh, all over the world? But um, lots to get to there. And uh, I want to get right after it here uh, this week because we got a guy joining us who is a Busy man. I think he just showed up to his next DP World Tour event, I'm sure, on another beautiful island, on another beautiful golf course. He's back here on the podcast, uh, Eddie Pepperell. How you doing, man? Yeah, great, Travis. Thanks for having me back. And uh, we are we're in Mallorca this week, which is uh, one of the little islands off mainland Spain. And um, yeah, beautiful place. So it's always a pleasure. We love coming to Spain generally. And when you get the opportunity to come to an island like Mallorca, it's a no-brainer. I've always and said... I should right, say, right. I've, sorry, I should say I've got a customary... Uh, glass of red wine as well which i may sip on as the podcast goes hey, by. hey i mean it's uh, you, yeah absolutely i mean it's only well it's noon here i guess i could i guess i could go ahead and uh well, hold on a minute let me see if i can get this in the yeah there we go i guess i could just oh, go okay. ahead and, i guess yeah. i could just go ahead and pour me a little uh yeah, just, too, while we're at it but um anyway um look i i always i've always said if if i was a good enough player when i was younger um to play professional golf I would have went to over to Europe and tried to play over there just for the simple fact of all of the great countries and places that you guys get to go play. I mean, it's it's unbelievable uh, the sights you get to see. I'm sure that the people that you get to meet, all of the uh, the different um, languages, cultures, it's just that's just that's just got to be pretty cool, man. Like for you to be able to do all that at such a young age. It really is, you know, and actually the older I get, the more I'm appreciating it. Um, Europe is, for me, the best continent on the planet. As you've described, there is such a rich history and culture here. Every country is uniquely different. And um, obviously, I know there are differences across America, but um, there are some quite extraordinary differences across Europe, whether you travel east to west, north to south. Um, the people are so different, and yet they are all encompassed under one landmass uh, and under one political and economic union it, it's really unusual but as a golfer to travel to all these countries and, and just to witness it all the food the weather the wine the golf the camaraderie everything like you described i i personally think that's the the high the re most redeeming feature of the european mm -hmm. tour dp world tour as it's now known yeah two times now right you've won on the uh, dp world tour uh 13th in spain 28th alfred dunhill links 12th at the italian open where's the uh where's the game at as you uh head into this week it's um been a year of two halves for, for sure i mean the first half of the year i couldn't make a cut and seemingly now i can't miss one um so see people it's it, the same for everybody right yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's so true you know golf is a it's just it's such a as I've experienced again in the last 12 to 18 months, like I did back in 2016, um, just such a difficult game when you get on the wrong side of things and, and playing professionally as well, uh, it, week in, week out, it can just, it can really tear you apart a bit. I think what's been a bit of different, however, about the last 18 months up to July of this year was, that was a bit different from 2016. In 2016, I really lost my game when I lost my card. Last year and as early part of this year, I, I didn't feel like I was playing terribly. I just, I'd lost my good stuff and um, mm -hmm. I was often shooting 71, 72, missing a cut by a shot, um, which is a different kind of um, frustration, obviously, and, and it does it does weigh you down. But since July, I've played a lot, lot better and um, I've improved my swing for sure. And uh, and then my confidence is beginning to come back, which which is now I feel like I'm on a very similar trajectory as to what I was on at the end of 2017 when I, I had a similar run of consistent form and uh, and then my confidence grew the year after the years after that whereas it's mm -hmm. when I then began to play some of my best golf so I think some of my best golf is possibly approaching if I keep doing what I'm doing so last week um Valderrama uh, the uh, DP World Tour was there it was the uh, Andalusian Masters uh, guy by the name of 
Adrian Otegi. I say it right? That's right, I think, yeah. Yes. Oh, Adrian. Uh, of course, he wins by six shots there at Valderrama, which is one of the best courses I would imagine over there. I've never played it, but it certainly feels that way. And of course, you know, Adrian, um, you know, he, he's a guy that, that earlier in the year, uh, like many, went to live, played in the first three events, um, and got suspended, right, by the DP World Tour, and then um, fought it, right, appealed it along with uh, Ian Poulter, and those guys got to play in the Scottish Open, which was earlier in the season, right? And it's a little different, I guess, in how um, the legal matter went about between the DP World Tour versus what happened over here in the States and the PGA Tour because they didn't allow those guys that wanted to play in the FedEx Cup. And nonetheless, um, you know, he went over there and played. Now he's able to come back and play with you guys, as did Ian Poulter. I'm curious. Um, I'll ask it this way. The guys that went, took the money with Liv, and now trying to fight their way back, win and play in your events, what, what's your stance on that? How does that, how does that make you feel? Um, <clears throat> me personally, I, I think the way I feel is irrelevant. At the end of the day, this is about the law, and I think that's of paramount importance. So I, I, it's easy to... Clearly, that's going to be on a spectrum. There are going to be guys who have different sets of emotions about these guys showing up. Some simply won't care. Some will care and, and really not want them there. But, eat, but it doesn't matter how you feel. Um, the law is the law in the UK, and we are governed by UK law and, and the DP World Tour, as you've already mentioned. So, mm -hmm. you know, they, they I think it was an injunction that, that they uh, that they won. I, I don't know how, this thing's, how all this works legally, um, but I know the appeal is happening in January, February next year, where a ruling will be given that will be much more definitive. Now, um, that's quite an interesting. Uh, it's going to be very interesting to see how that plays out for a number of different factors. In the UK, individuals are high, heavily protected when it comes to anti-competition. Um, and, you know, there's not a lot that, that, which is, I believe, the reason why the DP World Tour never single-handedly handed out bans, which is different to what the PJ Tour did, obviously. Instead, mm -hmm. we, we did sanctions. And um, if, if they don't pass, then it, it sets an interesting precedent from not just our perspective as a tour, but for any sporting body, because it basically then sets the precedent that uh, your sanctions that, and your rules effectively are unenforceable if the individual decides to you know take action which would be a very strange precedent to set now that being said the sanctions have to be uh, fair and um proportionate and that's where maybe the hundred thousand pound fines or whatever were handed out and the two event suspensions these might be shuffled around a bit or changed but i, I would be surprised if there isn't some upholding of the, the law come of the rule of, of the sanctions come february 2023 and then um what, what follows from there, I don't actually know. But yeah. uh, if the players are to win that, then it's going to be interesting. But from my perspective, to answer, try and answer your question, you know, I, I haven't, I don't feel too strongly about it. Um, I can yeah. understand the frustrations on the players' side who don't feel they should be there equally. Um, people like Ian and Adrian and, and others believe that it's their right to be there. And, and at this point, um, that, that is true. So um, there's not a lot I can do about that. You think, do, do, do the, but, the majority of the players over there, do you, are they feel the same way? Are they kind of like, yeah, it is what it is. Whatever which way it comes down, it is what it is. Are there others that maybe are a little more personal about it? Like, hey, you went and took the money. Tail end of your career, Ian. Tail end of your career, Lee Westwood. Tail end of your career, Graham McDowell. Um, and you got the money. A lot of it. Up front. This and that. And you're playing for a lot with limited fields, no cuts. And now you're coming back and taking spots from us, Sergio Garcia, and withdrawing after the first round. I mean, there's got to be some guys that are like, wait a minute here. I mean, <laughs> you having your cake and eat it too, and now you're kind of rubbing it in our face with the withdrawal and heading back after the first round because you played bad. Yeah, well, listen, I agree with you. I, I think Sergio acted um, it was pathetic, and he's been obviously criticized heavily for it. And I would um add to those voices i mean uh, i haven't got a lot of time for some of the actions and the words that he's personally has said um and i can understand everything else you just said and, and i would on balance uh, agree with that um i think that there is a lot of frustration but equally there are a number of players who would have taken this opportunity had it come to them as well and i think that they're honest and would admit that 
so it's a difficult one um, mm -hmm. in many respects. But I, I yeah, I, I would on balance agree with what you've just said. And, and but ultimately, the, the decisions that are made, we, there's just not a lot we can do as a tour legally. So um, it is what it is. And I mm -hmm. think the frustration I've obviously had, and as has probably come across on Twitter a couple of on a couple of occasions, uh, directed Lee Westwood, um, to be specific. It's just some of the comments that have obviously then come about be you know after the fact and um i have absolutely no issue with any of these players going and playing to live or it's it's um it's entirely their prerogative and i would support that but i think to i think that there are some things that are maybe not that enough people maybe understand about the the situation with some of these individuals and live namely that they are shareholders in the business of live so it is now it is now of their interest to make live mm -hmm. successful and work because financially they will be heavily and highly rewarded more so far more so actually than they already have been if indeed it is to be successful and so i think there is a bit of a conflict um of interest in some respect here and and i i i think that that should be acknowledged part of some of these individuals and um i just have a, a hard time when i see some of the guys i mean there was an it was a, something that, that happened last week in Valderrama where I picked up on uh, a journalist wrote an article bemoaning the standard of the field at Valderrama, criticizing the, the way in which it, it isn't what it used to be. And um, I think apportioned a lot of that blame will cast certainly a lot of aspersions on the DP will talk as at fault for that. And Lee mm -hmm. and Ian both um, praised the article. And what frustrated me about that, and the reason I asked the question that I asked Lee and Ian on Twitter is why aren't you there is because I knew the answer to that question and I just wanted them to answer it honestly, which neither of them could do. And that's because the truth is they can't be there. Even if they wanted to be there, they can't be there because as you've, as you've already said, with Liv, there are contracts involved. So, you know, they're kind of criticizing the tour for not playing for them, for, for the event, not having the strength of field that they actually can't compete in anyway. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's a, it's totally backwards. And, um i think a lot of this stuff is unfortunately that there does seem to be a lot of incongruencies and just things that the contradictions um unfortunately yeah let me let me ask you this so like with lee he's been vocal right lee westwood's been been very vocal and i think one of the things that he continues to come back as i look at my notes here is his um this strategic alliance between the dp world tour and the pga tour which started oh, i don't know about a couple years ago i think the pga tour had like 15 percent of the european um, tour production of the pga or the dp world tour excuse me production and now as they re it up and redid it it's like 40 percent now so the pga tour is is very much part of what's happening over there and with the dp world tour and, and of course it's referred to as the strategic alliance and I think I've heard Lee refer to it as, you know, a feeder system, right, for the DP World Tour over to the PGA Tour. Nonetheless, he he's very triggered by this. You know, there's he, I don't think he likes the way these two tours um, have come together. As you look at it, maybe not so much in response to Lee, but as you look at the strategic alliance as a player on the DP World Tour, um, how do you think it's going? And And have you heard what's coming down the path? Are you a... Are you excited about this strategic alliance? Well, I think it should probably be said that not a lot has changed. Uh, you know, if we look at what actually has happened in the last 10 years, certainly since I've been on tour, at any point when somebody like I did in 2018 entered the top 50 in the world, they took an opportunity to go and then play in America. Now, you know, if they did well and they get their card for the year after, invariably they would go and play full time on the PGA Tour and come back and play the, the minimum events that they had to on what was then the European Tour, which was lowered and lowered and lowered to accommodate a lot of these guys that have actually gone to live mm -hmm. um, and others like Rory McIlroy, et cetera. So nothing has really changed. This, this, this kind of feeder-like uh, system has been in place for years and years now. And that isn't, in my opinion, because there is some monopoly on the game of golf it is because the pga tour offers the best product whereby the best players come together more frequently play for the most money in the best events and i can say that as somebody who's played the best events on the pga tour fortunately mm -hmm. for, uh, for one year um now i believe that is just the, the, the truth and there are other uh intangible factors that, that really no one can control like currency 
and strength of currency, and then also other some the way the business itself is set up, which I think the PJ Tour has benefited from. So when you weigh it all up, you know it's it's fairly obvious as to why most guys would choose to go and play on the PJ Tour if and when the opportunity arose. Now, all that's really happened in the last six to nine months is on top of that, we now have ten guaranteed spots at the end of the year from next year, and if a player gets out, they're going to receive five hundred thousand um, dollars up front, just the way the same way that any PJ Tour player is going to at the same time. So, from my perspective. Now, of course, there are the other side to that. So that's not all positive. I mean, the, the PGA Tour, as part of that deal, has had to buy an extra 25% or have bought an extra 25% equity in, in the company of the European Tour Production. So now they own 40% of that business. Um, and But they are investing tens of millions of dollars um, into the foreseeable future as well. So that's, I think, as I understand it, the basic and there's stuff I may have missed, but that's as I understand it, as it kind of roughly sits. And uh, as somebody who, you know, if I have a good year next year, speaking personally, and I was to take one of those 10 spots, I wouldn't go and play on the PGA Tour. And the reason is, is because yeah. I love playing in Europe. I'm going to be earning a lot of money in Europe anyway. And that's the lifestyle I want to live. Yeah. And so not everybody may go. I think most will go. And I, if I'm being quite, quite brutally honest, I think most that do go will realize pretty quickly after going, oh, God, this is really difficult. And um, for whatever reason, the standard, the travel, everything else, and they may decide to come back and play in Europe anyway. So I think there are there's many ways to see it. You also yeah. shouldn't. Sorry, to, if I say one more thing, if I may say oh, the, the impact that this may have on enticing other young talent globally is, I think, going to be significant, too. Um, you know, if if somebody like Kirida Kafi Barna, Rafa Cabrera Bello, Matt Wallace, who's just got his card, but may not have done. People like this, who are fantastic golfers, who who are going to be an asset to both tours. You know, if they if they fall out and they don't get their PGA Tour card, we need to ensure that their first reaction is to go, I'm going to go back and play on the, the European Tour. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we have to supply and provide those individuals with a, an attractive schedule in 2024 onwards, which is when we really have some control now. Um, so I think that's the plan. And then I think I can see how that would work. Now, equally, a lot of people say to give you away your 10 best assets every year is crazy. And I can I can see that side of the argument, too. But that's just part of the deal we've had to make with the PGA Tour at this point. And then we could maybe then get on to why the, I think the frustrations from some would be, well, if that's that deal that I've just described, why didn't the European Tour partner up with Live Golf? And, and that is a slightly separate conversation, which we could explore um a little bit but i, I think it's one with sort of maybe worth having yeah no I, it's it's a perfect segue thank you very much to my uh <laughs> to my <laughs> next question i mean you make so many really interesting points there i think that my audience is really going to appreciate coming from a player on the dp world tour because you're seeing it through that lens 100 percent. you know we we see it over here in america obviously from the pga tour lens and i i think it's it's very easy to just stay in that lens when the reality is that there is an alliance over here, DP World Tour, which is important to the PGA Tour because they need more of this global enterprise, right? And, and, and we know that's been brought to the forefront through the emergence of Liv, who just played in Saudi Arabia, who just played in Thailand. Now they're coming back to the United States and there's going to be more of that reach across the world. So. Um, I think from Lee's perspective, probably Ian Poulter's perspective, Lee Westwood, that is, is why wouldn't you run your tour in a way that would be, yeah, you can do some things with the PGA Tour, but why wouldn't you want to just be able to strengthen it, its own ecosystem, right, um, and, and make it kind of more of a competitor to the PGA Tour rather than just aligning with them and then giving them your 10 best players every single year, quote, the, the feeder system. So that takes me to this next question is I want to make it kind of a two-parter. I don't want you to speak on anybody's behalf, but I am curious just the overall tone of other players. And if, if there is a majority here of from the DP world tour, like, gosh, we should have partnered with LIV. It would have been our opportunity to put a bunch of money into our tour and keep our own people and really be a competitor to the PGA tour. Like, is that, is that a common, um, opinion? Would you say amongst some of your former players? 
I think it, I think it is, but I think when you dig down, and as I understand the proposal that was initially put forward, and bear in mind, I haven't seen the proposal, but I've spoken to everyone that was in the room and a number of others. So I believe that what I've been told is true. And so mm -hmm. I think I can speak on what I think the proposal has within it. And, and that is that the initial cash injection from Live was going to be $50 million, which isn't a huge amount of money. Okay. Um, and Live was going to exist. So even if the European Tour and Live had to come together, Live as an entity, 48 guys, 54 holes, 14 events, that was going to sit on top of the European Tour. So it wasn't going to be an amalgamation of the tours. So if, if you were to ask me the question, how does the European Tour take on the PGA Tour, which, by the way, I would love to do. I mean, I think it would be fantastic. And I think there's a, a glaring opportunity for if the proposal, let's say, had been Saudi Arabia or the PIF fund have all of this money and we're going to come to the European Tour, Asian Tour, Sunshine Tour, everybody, and say, do you know what, we want to take on the PGA Tour and we want to do it this way. We want to have 35, 40 events globally in the best cities in the world. We're going to be playing for a lot of money every week. Um, but we're going to, importantly, and this is the thing that I think is important, is we're going to keep larger fields, namely 140 guys. We're going to keep cuts. We're going to keep 72 holes. We're going to maintain the structure of professional golf, as I think that I think is very important. Mm -hmm. That is something that I think would have been an extremely attractive proposition. And I actually don't think, actually don't think Keith Kelly would have turned something like that down, or at least I think he would have given it a great deal more consideration. The more I've understood about the proposal that was on the table, I've come to realize actually it wasn't a fantastic proposal anyway. Okay. And a lot of the big sums that were thrown around, it's worth just remembering, were based on equity stake. So the European Tour offered 2.5% in live, and my understanding is 5% of one franchise. Well, if you are the European Tour, and, and, and if you're if they're saying well, in five years time that's going to be worth 300 million dollars well you're going to have to do the maths on what the overall uh, live golf is going to be worth but it's going to be worth something like 15 20 billion dollars and by the way that's going to be equity so you're going to have to sell some of that to even realize the capital right you can't just draw you can't just that's not just cash in the bank you need to sell some of that equity to realize that cash so it, it a lot of the big the big figures the big figures that were doing the rounds early in the year were based off future valuations on a small equity stake in live golf and one franchise and if you ask me the valuation numbers that were put on those were nuts absolutely mm. crazy and and that's why i also think some of these guys who have who are equity share owners who are, who are owners of equity rather in these franchises i think they've been sold on some of the high numbers and the figures that they've been promised and uh, and i don't believe personally that they will come to fruition now live could become far more valuable than, than i am yep. giving it credit for but i don't think it will become as valuable as they, they were promised glenn Fittich, the world's most awarded single malt scotch whiskey is expertly crafted and made with extraordinary care each single malt is a work of perfection yeah it's fascinating really that because that's one of the questions i that we discuss a lot is is the positioning of the european tour dp world tour if you wanted to be a true competitor to the PGA Tour, it felt like this would be the opportunity to do that, an influx of money. But, you know, what is that deal, right? All we see on the outside is, all we see as consumers is we see, it was like one point on the telecast yesterday on on YouTube. Um, you know, Brooks Kepka wins the event and Peter Uline is there and they're kind of explaining you know, the team. And I mean, it was, there's so much money, you know, they, they like to throw that around in the telecast. Okay. If he makes this putt, it's man, he's going to make 3 million. And then, you know, if another birdie gets him another 1.2 million. And then if Brooks gets it with the team, it's 7 million. I mean, you know, it's like, even there's just, you know, a million, a million, a six million, seven, they're just throwing these numbers around. And, and as a consumer, we just, we just hear all this. And it's like, man, there's so much damn money. You know, yeah. and then we assume that, okay, well, why wouldn't the DP World Tour just take that money? <laughs> you know, all this influx of money and, and, and go into business with them. And now they've got this landscape of tournaments and countries and players and, and off they go. I mean, they're now a real competitor, but there's a deal and it sounds like it, it wasn't, it wasn't a good one. No. And I think, I think the tour would have taken the money. I, mm -hmm. I think they would have done had it been structured and delivered in a way that, Remember, Keith Pelly and the other guys, the chairman, everyone involved with the European Tour, they are responsible for upholding part of the structure of professional golf, the pyramid structure that we've all benefited from, 
the way the game is played, the traditions of the game. Now, this proposal, as we've seen with Live, and that's one of my big criticisms of it generally, is that it's such a departure from uh, traditional professional golf, which I didn't think was broken, that I understood could be improved, but I didn't think it was broken. And mm -hmm. I think you know, that was the thing that, that, and they were, that was, they were stubborn on that. You know, I think the narrative goes that, that it's the PGA Tour and Keith who have been stubborn. They've not listened. They've not been prepared to bend over back. Well, they've not been prepared to bend in any way, shape or form to accommodate Liv. But of course, in like any relationship, it, it's a two way, that's a two way street. And I know having spoken to Keith and mm -hmm. I trust his word on this, you know, he, he said to me that, that one of his proposals to the guys at Liv was to take the autumn fall and have eight events and put your product in that part of the year. It's a part, it's a time of the year where the PJ tour, you know, famously suffers. It's actually ironically though, our strongest part of the year or one of our stronger parts of the year. So he was prepared Keith to accommodate Liv at the expense of our own tour because he could see that Liv was going to be part of the furniture moving forward. Mm. Now they didn't want that because they wanted 14 events and they want their own thing. So, this comes to the point, well, if you're Keith Pellier then, and this is how I see it, and this is where I do agree entirely with Keith, if you put yourself in Roy McIlroy's shoes and you're going to sign up for Liv and you're going to play 14 times plus four majors, you might play three or four other times a year, which is not going to satisfy in any way, shape or form the, the, the needs commercially for the PGA Tour or the European Tour, quite frank, clearly. So, you know, you have to then go back to Liv and say, well, this is the reality you know, surely you can see that it's not going to work for us. And, uh, and that's just to me blatantly obvious. And, and so mm -hmm. these are all the things that have to be factored in. And, yeah. um, you know, I, I, yeah, that's where I sit with it. Yeah. Well, they're here now, right. And they've, they've kind of, they've dug their, their feet in, they've executed, right. um, a number of events now to this point, they're going to finish up in Miami here in a couple of weeks. They're prepared for season two. The PGA tour has very much now reacted. And you're going to see a very different uh, schedule, I think, um, starting s probably next calendar year um, when it comes to these elevated events, which is now a, I, I think, a, a, I, I think there's going to be a division there as well um, when it comes to players and, and people um, from that perspective and how the tour is going to operate there. The fall schedule will look very different, obviously. Next year. So there's just so many moving parts, and we haven't even got to the official World Golf Rankings discussion yet. <laughs> you know, it's, it's just like there's there's so many layers to it. I think in reading, understanding how the official World Golf Rankings work, uh, and what Liv has done up to this point, I don't think they're going to get World Golf Rankings for another, I'll say another six months. Um, no, I'll say another nine months. I don't think they get it before the first major championship next year. Now it'll be up to the masters to decide how they want to do it, you know, um, with, with the players, but I don't think official war golf rankings are coming to them, um, for at least nine months. How do you see it? Do you think they should get it? 54 holes, no cut. I mean, over and over again, or do they need to kind of come to the middle with more 72 hole events? Um, with the cut like you've been accustomed to in your whole professional career yeah i mean in cricket and i'll take i'll use cricket as an example because cricket has often been referred to uh with live um in cricket there are bat there are batting rankings and bowling rankings but there are bat batting rankings and there are rankings for test cricket and one day cricket and 2020 cricket and that's because they're very different forms of the game and so you can't measure two individuals accurately so they've had to create two different ranking systems now i don't think that's what golf needs nor wants when it comes to live and i don't think live is as different um from regular pga tour golf as 2020 is from test cricket but it is clearly different and therefore it, it, it shouldn't in my opinion uh receive the same uh reward the rewards or rankings it, it, there has to be so i i wouldn't Put the show on the other foot however if i think about the idea that dustin johnson or cameron smith isn't there augusta or aren't there, augusta in two years time or wherever next year and, and i know they will be because they're eligible um but these guys they should be at the majors you know i'm a golf fan so yeah. i want to see the best golfers come together and play the major championships now maybe someone like Joaquin neiman is a better example because you know he, he's somebody who's not won a major so 
you know, he could fall out and I think would still, he's, but he's clearly a top 50 player. Um, we should make sure that these guys are still playing the majors in my opinion, because I think that that's, that's would be best for the majors. But on the whole, if they're going to receive rankings, I think it's going to be a watered down version and they're going to be heavily impacted as a consequence of that. But that to me is the way it should be. And, um, yeah. and I think that, that that's pretty fair. And Yeah. I've always thought it's like a, it's like a two pronger, you know, one is, when you look at the official world golf rankings, one is that this is the way we're set up currently when you have a new tour series, whatever comes in and says, Hey, this, this is who we are. This is how we want to operate. This is what our vision is. Right. And so you, you get into that process and, and the official world golf ranking, the board or what it's made up of, all right, well, well, show us some legitimacy. Show us that you are going to do those things, right? And it's like set up to 12 to 18 months. Um, I would I would want to see someone in any business come in and say, well, well show it to me. Let, me. let me see it. Let me hear it. Let me feel it. Let me, all right, so, so it goes for a year. All right, now show me that you're going to do it again and show me you're going to make improvements. And, okay, so now you get into another. So I think, like, I think that's a fair time frame. And, of course, you know, Norman's coming in and saying, well, no, 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 no. You need to go back and retroactive the points, <laughs> you know, and that's, look, I mean, you, you can't let that happen. Now, on the other side of that, the second prong to me is like, you can't be so rigid also and say, well, we're just going to go ahead and keep you out and do everything we can. And I don't think that's a good thing for the four major championships. I think they have to stay above the fray. I think they have to be willing to change and evolve in today's world um and if that means that there's going to be you know a handful more of 54 hole events in on the pga tour or on the dp world tour or on the live tour and that's kind of drawing interest in golf across the world and we have the best players in the world playing in that i think you have to entertain that to some degree right and now yeah don't give them as many points for 54 hold no event okay so i think you can figure that out i don't know if i'm smart enough to figure that out but i do think i am smart enough that Let's not be so rigid, right? Because we don't like where the money's coming from. Or we don't like Greg Norman. Let's look at it as a whole. Um, but I do think 12 to 18 months is fair. You know, let me let me see it. Let me let me hear it. Um, let me see you make changes. Let me see you come our way a little bit of what we're asking you to do, right? And find some middle ground. But at the end of the day, I totally agree. We can't have the world. We can't have the four major championships not have the best players. To me, that's when golf globally is really fractured at that point if you're not getting those guys in the field. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I think um, I think two things that listening to you. One, um, if, if in 12 months' time, Liv are, are given points and, and everyone works towards that, well, under the new system of world ranking points uh in 12 months period in 12 months time uh, their points are going to be massively di diluted anyway because mm -hmm. primarily because of the size of their field so um their averages are clearly going to drop and then um there's only 48 guys playing obviously compared to 140 150 in europe and the pga tour so by the nature of the new world ranking system they're going to be playing for very few points anyway and so i think one obvious thing here one smart thing to do if you're the PGA Tour especially is to recognize that the net effect from that is going to be weakness in 12 months time so you mm -hmm. can allow them access and this is this goes back to my point well I haven't made this point yet but my feeling on sanctions themselves from the European Tour's perspective which I've been against because to me the best thing to do is to offer people choices mm -hmm. and the way you can do that is by changing regulations hopefully but rather than imposing fines bans and sanctions it's always better to give people choices and make them feel like there is at least an access so to me the world rankings would be better off giving them access in 12 months time acknowledging that in 12 months time their entry point is going to be way down you know a winner at live events may be going to get 15 points not 50. so you know if you finished third or fourth at a live event you're not really going to move very far so someone like cam smith he, if he does if he finishes third or fourth he might start to go oh well i'm dropping down but I mean, I can't complain because I'm part of the system. They've allowed us in. So that would be one thing. And then the other thing that could maybe happen is a bit like what's happened on the European Tour in the last couple of years, these mini order of merits into the majors. You know, 
that that to me is is smart um, and and it allows access into the majors where we're not probably going to get them through all ranking points. And I think that that is um, that is maybe another thing that could be layered in here. You know, your events on live in February, and March, top three get into Augusta. There's a qualification it actually adds something to live golf, which I think is probably missing anyway. So hmm. there are two things that I think could could maybe be added. And I'm just going to say that someone's knocking on a hotel door here, Travis. So if all someone right. comes in, then I'm out. So I'll just go away. Well, that's uh, you know, you've been you've been fantastic. I, I appreciate your time. I know um, you've got a full glass of wine there. Oh, sorry, could you uh, <laughs> come back in a little while? Thank you. Maybe she's bringing another glass of wine. Another bottle of wine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I could talk. Look, I could talk about this stuff. I mean, I do. I talk no, listen, about all. Trans, I don't need to go. You, you. Talk as long as you want me. I don't no. need to go. I don't know where to go. No, I, I think we, we've covered. You know, the basis of it really. Um, in your perspective, I would add one. If I could say one more thing, yeah, or one thing that I was going to say earlier, that yeah. when you referred to the European Tour taking on the PGA Tour, this is something that we tried when Keith came in. Keith was quite aggressive. You know, if you think back to the Rolex series, um, that was an aggressive play from Keith. His vision was to offer top players an alternative to the PGA Tour. So we, we created these eight Rolex series events, big prize funds at the time. They were up at $7 million. And this was around a period when I think the PGA Tour was sort of 7 or $8 million themselves for some of the bigger events. And Keith quickly realized and learned, and he acknowledges this, he couldn't take the PGA Tour on for a multitude of reasons, some of which we've covered. And, and so I think he's realized that you, you just can't fight the PGA Tour um, because they're so strong and powerful in many respects. Now, I don't think they're strong and powerful because of nefarious reasons. I think this is the other thing that's out there. You know, I see online PJ Tour are bullies, the PJ Tour of Monopoly. Well, the Premier League is the best league that footballers come all around the world and play in, but we don't accuse them of being a mon monopoly. You know, they're just, there's lots of factors that go into the PJ Tour being as strong as they are. So the European Tour has tried to take on the PJ Tour. Mm -hmm. I found it, found it impossible, frankly. So, um, you know, I just wanted to add that in. I should have said it earlier. Yeah, it would have no. made a lot more sense earlier. Well, it, it was its own. It was its own identity, right? When those guys were younger, um, Lee Westwood, Ian Poulter, um, those guys were Graham McDowell. Those guys were playing over there more, and the PGA Tour did get strong. And eventually, they had to come over here and play. You know, on the PGA Tour, and they were, I don't know, um, they, they were they had they had a product where those guys could come over and make more money, right? It was a bigger tour and there was more money to be had. So a lot of those guys came over there, obviously a week in the state of the European tour. Um, and now the decision based off of what has transpired, as I understand it, and, and listening to you has been very insightful uh, with Liv going to Keith Pelly, who runs the DP World Tour. And it didn't work out. I mean, it wasn't a good deal. And now um, Pelly moving DP World Tour to be strengthen in their alliance um, with the PGA Tour. And clearly, these two hitting this thing head on um, when it comes to live golf, right? And and trying to protect those tours and what's going to transpire there. Of course, official World Golf Rankings, which both those guys are a part of, um, and, and how that's governed with representation from the PGA Tour, DP World Tour, the four major championships. I think there's an international federation of PGA Tour. There's someone that sits on that. There's like seven people, right? And then there's a board. So there's there's other entities uh, coming in. Um, and that's how golf is set up. All four major championships are governed individually. <laughs> you know, yeah. you got these, these other tours and then they make decisions based on the official World Golf rankings. I think that, I think the, I think, look, PGA Tour in its alliance to DP World Tour, like you can strengthen and, and you can, you know, really and really position yourself against live golf. I think that's one thing. I think the four major championships have to stay above that. I think the official world golf rankings have to stay above that. And we've got to have the best players playing in the major championships. We just do. And I also think yeah. look, I'm comfortable. I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable with the Ryder cup and the president's cup staying above that as well. You know, it's, it's, it's Europe versus the USA. I, I want, I want those guys on the team. I want to see that. That's great for golf. I mean, I just, you know, the, the President's Cup, I saw Trevor Immelman um, in, out in, in Las Vegas after, and he was sitting there and we were, he was, we were having a little glass of wine and said hello to him. And, and I just said, hey man, I don't know, I don't know if I should say congratulations on such a great fight or I'm sorry, <laughs> you know, because like I wanted those guys playing on your team. 
I, you know, and I get it. I get all this over here and this, but I wanted Cam on your team. I wanted Leishman on your team. I wanted Neiman on your team. Uh, I wanted Abraham answer. I, I want that as a fan. Damn it. I only get it once every two years. You know, I only get the Ryder cup once every two years. So I want those guys. I want those guys in the major championships. And I just hate to see this get in the middle of what I think are the biggest events in golf Four major championships, Ryder cup. I put the Ryder cup perhaps against the, major championship from viewing my, from my perspective oh yeah i think, um, it's, I think it's i think it's better i mean I'm yeah. really biased because i'm obviously british or american but um i would just say on this is that my initial reaction to live golf one of my my biggest concerns with it um which is why i think i can fully understand the response that both major tours have taken is that I haven't seen their responses necessarily as being about protecting themselves commercially. Now, that may be very naive of me to say that, but the point I'm trying to make, what I would say is, is that it's about the, the foundation of the game, the tradition of the game and the structure that's in place professionally to allow me in 2012 to start playing golf in the Challenge Tour and six years later nearly win an Open Championship. Let's say I can use myself as an example, and that's a bit mm -hmm. narcissistic, I know, but my, you know, the, the, it's purely meritocratic. Nothing gets in your way. Nothing stops you. There are layers that you have, the ladders you have to climb. And this is not something that we should... I think that is the threat that Liv poses. And I think that that, is, that was my instinctive response to Liv mm -hmm. was, oh, my God, oh, shit, if Liv takes off... Mm -hmm everything really there is kind of out of the window it's got just it's just thrown away and and i think that has been behind some of the harsh response from pga tour european tour dp world tour or whether it's peter dawson whoever it is these guys are responsible for upholding the pyramid of professional golf and, and i think that is the biggest threat that live poses in my opinion and and that is something that i'm fundamentally wholeheartedly against and that doesn't mean to say i cannot be persuaded around to shrinking the game of professional golf it's making it more efficient making it more streamlined in some way shape or form so that so that the consumer or the, the viewer is more have, highly entertained by it but but we have to that would have to be done in a way that's much more careful and surgical than just trying to turn golf into formula one overnight yeah, it, it's um, it's such a departure, and I think that, that that's the thing, and and the fact that the fact that it's spearheaded by Greg Norman, who notoriously hates the PGA Tour, it's it's funded by you know a sovereign wealth investment fund from a very very rich Arab nation with obviously very questionable human rights records. I'm not passing judgment on it. I think I think that's fact. All of these things have to be considered, mm -hmm. and I think that if you are the um, custodians of golf and you know you're gonna you're gonna be take you you're gonna have to take that very seriously and that's where i sat with it so you know clearly i'm still on that side of the fence but i'm also with you i think that there needs to be we need to be mature enough as a professional golf across the board to to try and work it out in a way but i will say this i don't think there's any there's going to be any true cooperation between three entities i, I can't see it no. happening i think that no, no, so. I, don't, I don't see that happening right now yeah. no no, I agree. Eddie, that's well said. I, I, I really um, appreciate your time. I, I wish uh, best of luck this week. Go get yourself your third win. Um, yeah. And uh, cheers to you. But I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and um, I'm going to go ahead okay. and pour me a little. I appreciate it. Eddie Pepperell, thank you. For joining the Stripe Show pod. Thanks, mate. Appreciate that. PXG has done it again with the launch of a new lineup of drivers, fairways, hybrids, and irons. The new Gen 5 golf clubs deliver significantly increased MOI, faster ball speeds, longer distances, and tighter dispersions, all coupled with the exceptional feel and sound golfers have come to expect from PXG. Schedule your custom fitting or buy online at pxg.com.